Hey guys, so this video is meant to be a recap of the two-part workshop I did last year in research skills on how to use Stata for pretty much what you would need for the basics of your thesis. This is not entirely comprehensive of everything you would ever need to know, and also some of the concepts that are described here may not be actually described in detail, such as the event study. Now, the purpose of this is to address a problem in research skills in which Stata was brought about out of nowhere and had to be learned from scratch comprehensively in a very short window of time. And so hopefully this video can get a lot of that in the same instruction out in a more efficient way ahead of time so more time can be spent on better things as well as uh, students having enough time to learn Stata in order to properly do their projects and thesis. This is also not limited to the master's level, but also this should be helpful for the bachelor students as well. And for ease of navigation, on the top right of the screen in red, you will see some sort of section header. Now, I do want to point out that a couple sections, such as event study or creating variables, have a, the introduction of a lot of different functions within those sections. And they should be on your screen and so you can kind of see what you're looking for. Of course, I will also put the timestamps in the description, and if there are any questions, you're welcome to ask them in the comments, but if you are also looking at this for help with a particular course, uh, it is also recommended that you just ask uh, questions in that designated by your instructor, unless that instructor is me. But anyway, enjoy it, get what you can out of it, and again, Feel free to ask any questions wherever you may ask them. So the first thing we want to talk about is how Stata works, what is Stata, blah, blah, blah. As you can see here, this is the Stata interface. You have this little this screen that's like an output window. On the left, you have the command history. And on the right, in which we have no data, which will change, we will have some data to work with. And let's just pull out this, just something random. So you'll see on the right side, there will be a list of variables. And so this is the general interface. You can type in this down here, the command line, you can type in things like summarize, for example. And it will give you summary statistics of your variables. It will come up in this window. And as you can see, uh, when I typed that command, it came up in the history on the left. Now, sometimes when you have data open, one of the first things that you're gonna wanna do is use this thing called the data editor here. And what it will do is it brings up this window that kinda gives us a feeling of like an Excel file. You see it's a grid, it has data. Uh, the red text indicates that it is a string, and the black text indicates that it is a number. So a string, as you know, it's kind of like just text. You can't add them together. They're denoted with usually quotes around them, uh, where numbers are, as you would guess, numbers. You can also, in the data editor, change things. Like 875, ugh, I don't like that being there. Let's change it to just five. You can do that. It's not recommended that you just type in data like that, but it's a thing you can do. One thing right off the bat that's important to know is, in Ex this is the one thing that Excel can do that, it, that Stata can't do, is, okay, I just changed, illness days for this observation to five from 875. Don't need to do that, man. Let's just control Z. Oh, I controlled Z and nothing happened. That's the thing that Stata can't do. You can't undo what you've done. In this case, notice a few things. The first thing is, when I change this to five, the text came down here. So another thing to notice about Stata is, anything you do, no matter how you do it, it will always say it in code, when you, whether you type the code or whether you do it another way. So the, the way that you undo things is you just load the file. That's, that's the jet. Although there will be other ways that are more efficient, but that's the general way. And then lastly, there's a thing called a do file editor. So a do file is very much like a script in Python or another language where you can actually type the code ahead of time, and then you can execute it all at once or piece by piece. 
And so in this case, if I wanted to type summarize and then maybe I wanted to generate a variable, I could just click up here. And then in the window, as you can see, it, will, it does this do file, it runs the summarize, it runs the generate, which we'll talk about that generate and all these functions soon. One last thing to note is one thing that makes learning Stata easier is most of the functions in Stata, even if you don't know the code for it, there is probably a way you can, po let's say, point and click. For example, this, summar this finding summary statistics, I happen to know that the command was summarize. But maybe if you don't want to go and figure out what that is, there's also a way to click to it. If you go to like statistics, you go to summaries and tables and tests, summary descriptive, summary statistics, anything brings up a window. And as you can see with this window, there's a lot of options you can do. You can change the display, you can change the variables, you can change a whole bunch of stuff. And if you just click OK with no additional options, it does the same thing here as it did when I just typed it. So if you don't know how a particular function, how to type it out, but you know what it is, one of the ways that you can just do it is just by pointing and clicking, and then it will actually tell you what the code is, and then you're good. Another thing to keep in mind is literally everything has a code associated with it. Specifically, if I were to save this right now, like if I were to just save this as, you know, test, even that has a code for it. And it shows up in the history. So everything you can do has a code, and everything you do do generates that code whether you type it or whether you do it manually. And so that's kind of a convenient way for Stata to track what you're doing and also for you to kind of learn how to type things. But now that we have kind of the baseline of how Stata works, we're going to open a do file that's pre-written that has a lot of lines of code, and we're going to talk about what those lines of code mean and show what they look like in practice. So with do files, you'll see that there's a lot of different colors here. The first thing to know is that there is code, and if you've been following Python, you'll be familiar, or any other coding language. There's code, and then there's comments. Code does things. Comments do not do things. Comments are meant to communicate with whoever's reading the code, whether it's you're writing it for yourself or you're writing it for others to follow along. It's recommended to use comments when you're writing your own code, so if you visit it a month later, you have some idea of what's going on. So comments are denoted in green. And so starting off, we have clear in CLS. This is very highly recommended to have when it comes to having any do file because when you run a do file from scratch, you want it to do the same, have the same result every time. But when you do this, what happens is clear essentially removes all the data from the file and CLS clears this output window. This third line sets the current directory. So the current directory, in this case, set to the computer that I was using when prepping this. But for you guys, it will be different. So if you set the current directory to what is already on the do file, it will probably give you an error because that file does not exist on your computer. So the reason why we set a current directory is because we have this code here. It's very simple. We're gonna, there's a data file in that State of Fundamentals 1 folder called data main sample. And so it would be, if it were in a perfect world, it'd be nice if we could just type the title data main sample and it would open data main sample for us. Unfortunately, by default, Stata doesn't recognize data main sample. The reason being is because its directory is not set to the folder this file is in. So, what that, so let me tell you what that means. So essentially, imagine you're opening a window just like this file explorer, right? And so if, I ask, if, I, if you were on this screen of the file explorer and I told you, open data main sample, you would say just what Stata is saying. It's not here. So when we say set your directory, what that means is 
going to the folder and setting to what folder we're looking at. So by opening this statement fundamentals one folder, what I'm doing personally is I'm setting like my, my mental directory to this folder. So now if I say import data main sample, I'll be like, hey, data main samples right here. Great. So how do we do that for Stata? So we can do that for ourselves, obviously. We've used computers our whole lives. How, does, how do we get Stata to do that? Very nice thing is, this is the directory we want because all of our files are in it. So what we do is we see that we're in this folder. We right click the last, uh, the last item in that folder, that Stata Fundamentals 1 folder, and click copy address as text. So this is the file path up to the, and including the directory we want. So if you click copy address as text and then go to your do file and replace this current directory with what that is, and then set that directory. Okay, so it recognizes that there's this directory and it's updated the directory to the state of fundamentals one folder in this whole file path. So now if I import the data from Excel, it, it imports it, the data's here, it has nine variables and 30 observations, yes. Setting a directory isn't mandatory. It's mainly a quality of life thing. So now we have the data, and the thing is when we have data, what we usually wanna do is look at it. See if there's anything bizarre about it, see what we're working with. So in this data main sample, we can see we have some, vi some variables, QSIP, QSIP6, and name, year, sales, total assets, cash flow, stock returns, and sick days. And so this is a standard data set where we have three firms. We have firm A, firm B, and firm C. There are a few things we can do with this data set. Re I think the only reason why the university bothered to pick up Stata to teach you guys merging. And so we're going to talk about merging and we're going to talk about the difference between merging and appending. So we're going to start with the simple one, appending. Appending, the difference between appending and merging is appending adds observations, merging adds variables. In this case, looking at the data, we see we have 30 observations. We have firm A, B, and C and the year goes from 2002 to 2011. It, depending on what your goal is or what kind of person you are, whatever you're thinking, you might think, that's not enough data. I mean, I like what we have going on here, total assets and sales and everything. I mean, those variables are fine, but I wish I just had a few more firms in a few more years. That's where appending comes in, if you have another data set with that information. So if we were to open, like take a look at Data Extra, for example, we see that we have more data. We have more years for firm A and B and C up to 2016, and we even have firms D and E. And so we have all the same variables, but we have even more data. So what we can do is we can append it. We can either just copy this line from the do file, or more likely when you're appending a data set, you are not gonna just have this line of code written for you. The way that you would most likely do it in practice is you would go, and this is the way that I personally do it, is you go to data and you go to combine data sets. And so you're gonna see merge and append, and then two other things that you'll almost never click on. But let's start with append. So when you click append data sets, you're gonna have this window pop up. So the file name of the data set on disk is that extra data. And keep in mind, you cannot do this as an Excel file, it must be a Stata file. But if you find an Excel file you want to append, what you first have to do is import that Excel file to Stata and then save it as that Stata file. So we see that we want to append that data set that we just looked at, that extra one with the D and E. And if you want to append multiple data files, that's where this line would go. Sometimes 
you may have a variable indicating which is the appended and whatnot, but let's skip all that. Let's just say, I just want to append this and have no complications. And so, okay, there's no error. Sometimes it will give you this warning that it had to change the, the variable type that's completely normal. And now let's look at our data now. So we can see now that we went from 30 observations to 76. And we can see that after observation 30, we have more observations for A, B, and C, and we have that D and E as well. So essentially, through appending the data, we have extended our data set, and that's how you're gonna remember that, append and extend. I never learned that until yesterday. I never thought of it that way, but just remember it, it sounds cool. So we've extended the appended, we appended the data set to extend it to give it more observations. And so great, we have more observations. So it makes our statistical test stronger, it gives us more variation, it makes our analysis a bit more informed. So now that we have append, Let's talk about merge. So before we merge, I'm gonna, give you, I'm gonna show you an illustration of how merging, what merging is, how merging works, and the situations you might use different types of merges. So the way that merging works, the one we're gonna do and we're gonna start with is the one-to-one -one merge. So the one-to-one -one merge, what that means is you're gonna have two data sets in every merge. A one-to-one -one merge means there is a particular identifier that you have. Maybe it's a firm, maybe it's a year. Whatever it is, there's, for each of that firm or each of that year, you're gonna have one of that in each data set. And so, as you can see, the identifier, whatever that may be, one, there's I, one, two, three, four, five, and there's one of each of these. And in here, there's one of one, one of two, three, and six. If you have two ones, it's gonna give you an error. So, like if you have something like this, it's gonna give you an error. So, what's, what it does is it's very straightforward. We have identifier firm one with the variable called data that has a value of 100. What it's gonna do is for this variable, it's gonna search for the other single observation in the the, what they call the using data set, the second outside data set, that also has the identifier one, and add the variable extra data with a value of five. And so after the merge, it gives you this observation. As you can see, we still ha it's still firm one, but now we have a second variable from that second data set. And so for firms two and three, of course, it's gonna have, there's only a single two, it's gonna match it with the other two to get data and extra data, their respective values. And again, for three, and so on. Now, of course, in the master data, we have firms four and five, but they don't exist in this using data set. So what happens is, they're gonna remain in the data set, they're not gonna just disappear they're just gonna have their original values, but the extra variable is just gonna be blank or empty. So integers in Stata, if it's an empty cell of it labeled as an integer, it will be denoted as a dot, which we'll talk about that later. But that essentially the dot indicates it's empty. And of course, even in the using data, we see there's a firm six that's not in the master data. So what's gonna happen is, Firm six will still be added, but this is how one-to-one -one merging works, and that's what we're gonna do with our current data set. Uh, we'll talk about the rest of these merges after we merge our initial data set, because mer talking about the nuances of merging is actually super important, and also kind of amusing. So, in this case, we have another data set called, it's media SIC, so let's actually just look at that data individually. We see that we have QSIP year and name just like we have for the original data. We have firm A, B, and C for all these years. But now we have two extra variables, media and SIC. But essentially the big picture here is through merging, we wanna add these two variables to our existing data set. And so what we're gonna do is a one-to-one -one merge. If you try to do a one-to-one -one merge now, Let's actually try to do it in the uh, little manual clicky thing. 
you'll have a one-to-one -one merge. And let's say that we want to merge by firm name, right? And we want to merge with media SIC. And so if I click OK, we see an issue. It says variable name, as in the term, the, the variable called name, does not uniquely identify variables or observations in the master data in this current data set. So if we look at the master data, we see, obviously, firm name A is not a unique identifier. We see uh, 15 different observations with firm name A. So there is something that we do about that that's very common. So when you're doing data for your thesis and you're merging, pretty much never are you going to do it by firm if it's a one-to-one -one merge. However, a very common, I'm trying to think of the word frequency, or the, way that our, the term for the way that most data is separated or broken down, and you might read this, and if you've read like academic papers and read like the methodology or the data section, you might hear the term, it is at the firm year level. What that means is that the unique identifier in a data set is the firm year. So while, there is no, it, while the firm A is not a unique identifier, firm A in 2009 is a unique identifier. There's only one case where firm A is in 2009, and if you, re if you really want to verify that, you can do sort name year. We can, uh, we'll talk about sorting in a bit. But we can see here that, okay, there's only one observation for firm A in 2002 and 2003 and so on. So what we can do is we can go back to merge. The nice thing about this is it saves all the inputs. We can do name and year. So you can actually put in multiple variables to say if it has a unique combination of these two variables, you're good. And then what it does is it produces this window, and we take a look here. So we can see that in the cases where it's matched in the firm A had the year 2002 in both data sets, we now see that it has all of its original variables, and now it has the media and SIC variables. And so for the most part, in, in the perfect world, you're going to have most of your observations be matched. Uh, but if not all of them, that's okay. Now, as you can see with the Excel file, firm F did not ha firm F did not exist in this main data set we had, but firm F did exist in the media SIC. So what happens is all of these observations are going to be blank, but it's going to keep the media and SIC variables it brought with it. Very similar to in the illustration, where we had identifier six, it wasn't in the original data set, but since it was in the using data set, it brought it along with it. So in practice, the temptation that people have is to only keep those that are a perfect match. In reality, we want to actually preserve what we have in our master data. Well, fortunately, there were no observations from the master data that were not matched, but the common practice is usually after checking if this is something that would not hinder your analysis to drop observations where it where merge equals two, and what that means is it's where observations from the using data set do not match anything from the master data set, because if these observations, the sales and total assets are not here, then it's not really useful to us. So dropping, actually I'll type it manually, so drop is a function that refers to dropping either a variable or an observation. And usually based on how you write it out, it will indicate whether it's you're dropping an observation or whether you're dropping a variable. So if I were to type drop, usually you run a type drop if, and if is something that you can attach to almost any function, but we'll talk about that as well in a bit. But we want to say, okay, we don't really care for these observations that came from that using data set that we can't use in our analysis. So we're going to drop it if that merge variable equals two, which again refers to these observations. So if we do that, it'll say that it 
deleted 15 observations, we'll see that they are gone. And then we can also use drop to drop this merge variable when we're done. So one-to-one -one merge is not the only kind of merge you're gonna do. There's one-to-many, many-to-one, and then another kind that you're never going to use, but I will talk about it when we get to it. So one-to-one -one merge, as we saw, had a unique identifier in the master data and the unique identifier in the using data to add an extra variable. One-to-many is similar in the sense that in the master data, indicated by the first number, it is still a unique identifier. But in the using data, indicated by the many, the second number, there's actually many of a particular identifier. So the way that a one-to-many merge works is that it's going to take, for example, for at each observation in that master data, it's going to take it, it says, okay, there's a unique one in the master data, but, and there, we find multiple ones in the using data. And so what it does is it's going to take that uh, variable, or that, yeah, the variable with a value of 100, and it's going to copy that across all of the observations of that same identifier in the using data. So for identifier one, it finds three of them, so it's gonna take whatever data was in the master file and apply it to each of the firms with identifier one in the using data. Does that make sense? Is that, like, okay. And then of course, for firm three, it does the same thing, where there's multiple threes here, and then much like with one-to-one, -one, if it's missing from either, it's just gonna, it's gonna keep that observation, but it's going to have that missing value. And so many-to-one is the same thing. It's essentially the same thing, but the positions are flipped, where it is the master data has the duplicate identifiers, and the using data has unique identifiers. So a situation that's very common that you'll find yourself using a one-to-many or a many-to-one is databases have different frequencies of data. Some have quarterly, some have monthly. So you might have in CompuStat a firm year, but in, Q in uh, CRISP you might have a firm month within a year. So it might be a one-to-many or a many-to-one if you're trying to put the monthly data together with the daily data. And so the difference between one-to-many and many-to-one is just which, uh, essentially which data set you have open on the system right now and which one is the file that you're pulling from. Now, from one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-one, it would naturally follow that we would use many-to-many. -many. The thing is, what you think is many-to-many -many is actually called something else, and I will, it's called join by. And so what you would think many-to-many -many would do, but it's actually joined by, is let's say that you have multiple observations of firm one in the master set and multiple observations of firm one in the using set. So what you do here is for, it's gonna go one at a time. For each one of, let's say, data one, it's gonna start here, say data with identifier one is, has the v value 100 for data. So this 100 is gonna get matched with the five and the 7.5 as you see here, right? What it then does is it goes to the next one, says, okay, now the data value is 50. It matches the 50 with the five and the 7.5 and does the same for the 200. It then will go to the next observation, say the 250, and match it with all three of these, and so on. And so join by is essentially you're forming all these pairwise combinations of to these variables, and obviously it extends the data set quite a bit. I've only used this maybe two times in my time doing my dissertation, and it was for a very specific purpose that most of you probably will not need to do. And so this is why this is such a common misconception is because no one ever really uses it in the first place. But one thing that I ignored when I was told this that actually kind of screwed up my dissertation for a second was 
Yes, many-to-many -many merge exists, but it's not what you think it is. Many-to-many -many merge is something you should never use. I'm going to show you a very nice illustration of that, but first I'm going to illustrate why that is. So let's say we have the same, okay, well, yeah, whatever. We have these data sets where we have one to one, like we have this, right? So the way many-to-many -many merge works is, let's say it just starts from the first observation. So words, identifier one with data 100, identifier one, data five, cool. Next observation, identifier 1, 50, identifier 1, 7.5. Little weird we skipped the 5, but okay. Third one, identifier 1, 200. Oh, there's not another identifier 1. I'm just going to go back and use that previous value just for kicks instead of leaving it missing. And then, it, so that's kind of bizarre. Uh, so then when you go to the twos, of course, you're going to have, it's going to match the 250 with the 17.5 and the 50 with the 10. But what happens is the second one, the 50 with the 10, what happens then is that the second data set has three additional uh, observations for identifier two and the master data does not. So what happens is it's going to keep piling on observations with the 15, 12, and 11, but it's just going to be dragging down the 50. Intuitively, that doesn't make a lot of sense for most questions you'll answer. And I also I want to illustrate how confident the developer is was in how you should never use many-to-many -many merge. So, and this will actually carry into our next little lesson. So. If you look at the documentation, and after the break we'll talk about looking at documentation, and you go down, one thing that in a lot of the documentations is it'll give you remarks and examples. So if you go to remarks and examples for merge, and you go, go to many-to-many -many merge, it, it essentially kicks off the description. It specifies a many-to-many -many merge and is a bad idea. And because many-to-many -many merges are such a bad idea, we are not going to show you an example. And it's like, if you think you need the many-to-many -many merge, you need to essentially rethink what you're doing and find a way to make it a one-to-many or a many-to-one. Let's actually now go back to the do file to kind of continue. So what we just did is we merged one-to-one -one with media SIC and we dropped the merge variable. That's the last thing that we did. Now we're gonna do a many-to-one uh, observation or many-to-one merge in which we want to essentially get another variable. We want to know the GDP for each year. Now, what country that GDP is in? Actually, it's not specified because this is all made up, so it's any country you want. But we see here is that every year there's a GDP. However, there's not a unique year. So like there's multiple 2005s, multiple 2002s, multiple every year. So what we want to do is we do know that in our master data, it's many. And we know in our using data, if we take a look, the year is unique. There's only one GDP for every year. So we know that in the master data, we have repeats of years. And in the using data, we have only a single for each year. So when we do that, that's going to be a many to one. So we have many of the same year in our master data set and only one of each year in the using data set. And of course, it keeps the same stuff, so we're going to have to modify it a bit. And we want GDP. And of course, if you chose to keep that original merge variable, let's say you did all the merging and you were like, you know what, I don't want to delete that merge variable. What's going to happen is it's going to attempt to rename the merge variable merge, and then it's going to say merge variable already defined so it doesn't do the merge. So what I like to do you can, everyone does it the same way. Just, I do usually like merge two or something. And so we see here that we have from the results of this merge, we have now the GDP variable and we have 75 observations matched, but one observation from the master file not matched. And so as we can see here, we have now this firm E from 2019 and it, it 2019 did not have a 
uh, GDP value in the using data set, and so it is marked as a non-match from the master file. Common practice is you may want to drop those from the using file that are non-matched, but you want to be very careful if you're going to drop all the non-matches. So for the purposes of this, I actually do want to keep this observation. It has all the stock return data and everything for 2019 for firm E. It just doesn't have GDP. And so let's just hold on to that for now. One thing that comes to mind is obviously we talked about there's a lot of different options we can use with a lot of different functions. Like we talked about, I talked about in merging, where sometimes uh, you may only want to keep certain variables. Now, obviously, if you go into the menu and go in the little dialog box and click the options, that's cool. But what if you want to know how this function really works? So that's where the help function comes in. So if you don't know how a function works or you want to learn what it's capable of, you can do help and then whatever function we're talking about. So in this case, what if we want to talk about summarize? So there's a summarize function that gives summary statistics. And we can just type summarize by itself, as you saw. And it gives summary statistics for all the variables. Usually when you look at the help file, it will bring it up. It will tell you a very general description. It summarizes, or it calculates and displays variables, blah, 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 blah. And it gives a list of options. And so before we talk about options, we can talk about all of these. So when we say summarize, what's going to do is it's going to have like all these like optional features, like summarize, and then there's a variable list, an if, an in, and a wait. And so variable list would be something like, if I only want to know the summary statistics of the variables year and sales, it will only summarize year and sales and not the rest. There's summarize if, and we could say something like, let's look at the data and say that we only want to summarize uh, firms in which media coverage is less than five, for example. So we can do summarize if media is less than five. And we can see that it's fewer observations and the data is different. And the thing is, the if statement, as I may have mentioned with drop, is you can use if with almost, if not, with almost any function. And so then when it comes to in and wait, you're never really going to use them. But like just, just for kicks, I could say summarize year in one, and it's just going to summarize year in the first observation. Just those, this, so that's the kind of how it's describing these. It says you can use the var list, you can use if, you can use in. I never really understood how wait worked, and you probably won't either. You'll never use it. And then there's options. So in every function, there are these things called options. So options are denoted by you're going to put a comma. You can, you can honestly do like an if statement. You can do an in. You can do all this stuff. You can do if media is less than six. You know, summarize year sales, whatever. You can do all the, the, the variable list, the ifs, all that stuff. But then as soon as you put a comma, then there is a specific set of what they call options that this function can do. And so for spe uh, specifically for summarize, we have these options, detail, mean only, format, separator, all that stuff. The ones that you may use are detail and mean only. And so maybe I want a detailed summary statistics. I'll type detail, and then it will give a more detailed uh, descript summary stats. It gives like the percentiles. It gives the standard deviation, the skewness for kurtosis, all that for these variables. And that's how that works. And so if you ever don't know what a function is capable of, you can always just type help and whatever that function is and it will give you the same thing. It'll give you the syntax, it'll give you the options, and also descriptions and all that stuff. However, sometimes you might know that you want to do something, but you might have a hard time figuring it out. We'll talk in a second about this concept called Windsorization. 
I'll tell you about what Windsorizing is when it comes to it, but essentially there's this thing that we do called Windsorizing, and there's a function for it, but we don't know what it's called. So if I'm thinking in my mind, something very simple to describe, how do I Windsorize? You can type search Windsorize, and what it does is it's going to bring up statistical packages created in, in Stata that support that. Much like in Python, not all functions in Stata are pre-installed. And so if you want to install something, if it says like the package doesn't exist or whatever, you might have to find it and install it yourself. And the thing is, it won't specifically tell you, hey, you're missing a package. It will just say, we don't know what that is. And so if it finds a package, or if the package is already installed, it'll just bring up the help file. You'll just click on the link and then click, you know, click there to install. But we'll get to that more later. And lastly, of course, there's always the good old looking up how to do stuff on the internet. And the way you're going to do that is, you know, Stata, how to Windsorize. And then most of the time, you're going to find a YouTube video or you're going to find this website called StataList, in which StataList is kind of like Stack Exchange, if you're familiar, but it's for Stata, and it's where a bunch of Stata users get together and ask questions about how to use Stata. StataList is a, a pretty solid resource. So just like with a Python course, you don't have to memorize everything. You don't have to memorize all the functions, but you do know, need to know how to look stuff up. And so that's kind of a brief overview on how to get help with things. After we do that, now what we're going to want to do is let's talk about creating variables. So we've been getting new variables simply from merging so far. But we want to create our own. And there's a lot of different ways or you know, purposes of creating a variable. You might want to create a variable as an identifier. You might, might want to create one at, mostly as a function of another variable. And so, for example, a very common thing to do is taking the natural log of total assets. If you look at any like, academic paper, that is super common. So one thing we might want to do is we might want to generate a natural logarithm of total assets. And so you can type gen or generate or just g to get this variable. And so now we have this extra variable, this generate the natural log of total assets, which as you, you know, it's always nice to look because sometimes it might be an issue. But in this case, it's not. It's all fine. And now there's another case. And let's actually drop, get rid of this real quick, where we may want to create a dummy variable. So we know what a dummy variable is. It's a variable that takes the, the value between 0 and 1, and it's if this condition is satisfied, it equals 1. If this condition is not satisfied, it equals 0. When creating a dummy variable, what you can do is, let's say we want to take a dummy variable that equals 1 if the return is negative and 0 otherwise. What you can do is you can say generate, let's say, this dummy variable negative return. That's just the name of it. You don't have to specify it's a dummy. And then equals, and then instead of putting like a function like natural log of total assets, you can put a condition. So if you put a, something equal to a condition, it will assume it is a binary variable. If we say, okay, we're generating this variable that equals stock return is less than zero, what it's going to do is it's going to assign a value of one for all those observations where stock return is less than zero and zero otherwise. So we take a look, and it generated the variable, and we take a look here, and we see that in the cases where stock return is negative, it equals one, and where it's positive, it equals zero, and so on. Next is this thing, so we're talking about SIC codes, right? They're industry classifiers. When we look at data, a lot of times we want to classify by SIC because sometimes relationships between variables are different. For example, tangible assets might be higher in the railroad industry compared to the technology industry. And so when we do analysis, we may want to separate by industry. And so that's where SIC comes in. However, a four-digit SIC code, as informative as it is, might be too specific 
for our purposes. For example, a four-digit SIC code, for each digit, it becomes more specific. Let's pretend that for SIC 1234, that the one indicates that it is the food industry. The two indicates that it is the snack food industry. The three may indicate that it is among the sweets snacks. And then the fourth digit may indicate that it is chocolate. So that's awfully specific. No, uh, snack foods, though, that's general, and we can kind of make general, because the thing is we want to generalize stuff, so talking generally helps. So a, uh, another common thing that people do is SIC is an integer, so we're going to treat it like one. So what it does is it, what we do to get a two-digit SIC to make it more general is we're going to take the floor of the, so I'm just going to show you what we're talking about. So essentially we're taking SIC, divide it by 100, and then round it down. So in Excel, in the illustration, just, it's just randomly kind of put here. If we have the SIC code 1234, what it's doing is we're dividing it by 100, so it's 12.34, and then taking the floor function to round it down to the nearest digit, or the nearest integer. And so, of course, that's the same thing as now having just the first two digits of the SIC code. And so if we run this, then we now see that we have this new variable, SIC2, and for the 1, 2, 3, 4, it is now just 1, 2. Another thing we're going to kind of talk about is winsorization. I know we talked about, I, I use the term winsorization. So let's take a look at, let's look at our total assets variable and see it's some details about it. So what we see here is that we have a pretty decent range. So the 95th percentile of firms has a value of 71, let's say 71,000, so 71 million. Uh, and the 5th percentile is about 4 million. So it's a pretty big variety. And so we see at the 99th percentile, it's way higher. It's more than double the 95th percentile. And with the 1st percentile, it's pretty low as well. So sometimes, now in this data set, it's not that crazy, but in some cases, you're going to have insane and unreasonable values of total assets. And if you guys are familiar with like influential observations where you have outliers that are so far out there and they carry your result way more than they should, that can cause a problem. And so one way of dealing with outliers that's very common in finance research is doing this thing called Windsorization or Windsorizing. So Windsorizing is essentially you're taking the edges of the data. You, you may be either take, depending on your sample size and what field you're in, you'll take say the 99th percentile, or let's, in this case, let's say the 95th percentile of a variable, right? So the 95th percentile of total assets is 71,000. And we think that anything beyond that might be an outlier. So what we do is we winsorize at the 5th and 95th percentiles, which means any value greater than the 95th percentile, so any value greater than 71,000, will be transformed to just 71,000. And any value below 4,200, the fifth percentile, will be transformed to 4,200. So in your system, Windsor, the Windsorize function is not a standard default function in Stata. So as I think I demonstrated before, if you want to Windsorize, you can just type search Windsorize. And it'll bring up a few packages. The, the most common one, because it's more recent, is Windsor 2, and that's the one that I'll be using. And if you click on the link, it will ha you can just click, click here to install. And you know, for me, I already installed it. Then you go there. It should be pretty straightforward. So now that we have this package, we can now do Windsor 2. And so in this case, we want to Windsorize we now see that after we've winsorized at the 5th and 95th percentiles, what was for once 3,600 has now been transformed to 4,200, and what was 150,000 has been transformed to 71,000. So again, it has transformed all of the, the values beyond the 5th and 95th percentiles and just changed them to the 5th and 95th percentiles. Next, we're going to talk about...
lag and lead variables. So let's talk about what they are first, and then we can start playing with them and seeing what we're doing. So a lag variable is a variable from a previous period. So for example, if I am talking, if, I, if the year is 2005 in this observation, the lag, like, and we're talking total assets. So the lag of total assets in 2005 equals the value of total assets in 2004. So looking at the illustration, we'll actually illustrate this. So lag and lead variables, we see, let's say we have these QCIPs, like this particular QCIP and the year, 2002 to 2011. We have the natural log of total assets, let's say for 2000, let's say, let's keep it 2005. And then the lag of total assets in 2005 equals the value of total assets in 2004. But however, in doing them in Stata, it is quite tricky. You have to be kind of careful. In Stata, you'll notice a few things. If, for example, you have a year 2002, but not a year 2001, you will not have a, a lagged value of total assets. One thing in practice when you're getting uh, your data from words, for example, if you need, like on the project, what I would always recommend is like, for example, if the project says you need variables with, that take place between 2005 and 2020, you might want to actually get data for 2004 to 2021 because if you need a lead or a lag variable, it's gonna pretty much invalidate that last year in the sample because that last year won't have a lag value. Taking a look, when we want to take lagged values, there are a couple ways to do it, but I'll show you the most common way. It's most common, but it's also kind of dangerous, so we're gonna be careful here. When we are, the first thing we wanna do when taking a lag variable is sort the, the data. So, because the thing is, we're gonna, we want, for each firm, we want to have our firms in order and our years in order. So when you sort, you are sorting in ascending order. What that means is that, let's say, if I, I sorted by QCIP year. So what it does is it puts all the QCIPs together and then puts all the years in order. And so it's going in ascending order. So the lowest to the highest. The thing is, when we want to create a lag variable, what we want to do, I'm trying to get the, is we want to make it so we have a variable that equals last year's value of the log of total assets. So here's how we do that. So we're sorting, we sorted by QCIP in year. So we're generating a variable called lag of the natural log of total assets, and it's going to equal the natural log of total assets of the previous year. So brackets, so uh, there are a few functions, there's a few details here that are important to point out. In brackets, if you put brackets after a variable, it specifies which observation you are using. So underscore lowercase n, what that refers to is the current observation, and then you can do minus one plus one or whatever. So when we say ln of total assets brackets lower underscore lowercase n minus one that essentially is saying the previous observation of ln total assets if we were to just type this it equals the the previous periods ln total assets it causes a bit of a problem i'll show you in the illustration you can see here that at this observation the firm changes but if you don't put any condition on the lag, it's going to take, so 2002 for the second firm is going to take the previous value in the data set, but it's gonna take the previous value, but the previous value is 2011 for the previous firm. So what we wanna actually do is add a, a first condition, which is if the firm, essentially what this is saying is if the QCIP for both observations are the same, if we're working with the same firm. Because if the firm changes, that lag variable is not gonna mean anything. It's not gonna be relevant. Another point that's often forgotten as well is there's also the case, there's another condition you're gonna wanna put on, which is, and if this year, this observation's year, equals the previous observation's year plus one. So this will also not generate a lagged value 
four firms with four observations that are duplicate or observations that have skipped years. Because again, in this data set, if we go from 2016 to 2019, if we take the, just the lagged value, it's gonna take 2016's value. And that's, again, not really relevant to that time. And so it's misleading. So with this condition, we, we can generate this variable, this lag total assets, and we can see, okay, there are six missing values. So there's six cases of either the firm changing or the years not being consistent. And that's fine, because we have a solid you know, 76 observations. So we can see up here, the first observation is missing because in this case, there is no year before 2002. It's the first observation. This one's missing because the previous firm is different. Same thing for this. And this one is missing because the previous year is 2016 and not 2018. There is a way to tell Stata that you're using panel data. There's a thing called TS set. What this means is time series set. So it's establishing a time series in this. And so what you can do is you can input, say, here is your QCIP year. So it's your firm level data. And it says string variables are not allowed in Verilist, and QCIP is a string variable. There's this thing called encode. Encode QCIP. QCIP. So what encoding does is it specifically changes a it creates a new variable or you can replace it with an integer version of a variable that is a string, which sounds a little weird. Now there's multiple ways to do this, but encoding, what it does is it'll take QCIP, for example. Let's say this QCIP value, or let's, let's have one that makes sense. So this one has the letter A in it, so very clearly a string. So what it does, what, what encoding does, and you can see that it's in blue, so it's, it has a, what blue means is essentially the true value of the variable is different than what is displayed. Like with, with uh, merge, we could do drop if merge equals one. We didn't have to type the word matched in then parentheses. So what happens is this is saying that the encoded value, like we know that this QCIP is 34567A102, but inside of Stata, the true value of this QCIP is a number. It is an encoded number, and in the back end, there's a table saying this number equals this QCIP. So for us, we see a QCIP, and for Stata, it sees a number. In this case now, if we try to do the TS set, it now realizes, okay, this is panel data, where the panel variable, or that the firm variable is QCIP E, and then the time variable is year and it acknowledges that there is a gap. So also, it looks like this is getting a little cluttered. So let's actually, one thing that's nice to do in the data editor is you can uncheck a lot of these and kind of just like condense the data set just to kind of keep what you want. So now we can kind of see a bit more on the screen here. So one thing is, as we kind of talked about, summary statistics are a nice thing to have. We already did summarize, and we already did summarize detail and there's a lot you can do. The thing is, just typing them on your results window isn't always, I mean, sometimes you wanna share it with the world. You want other people to know that the average of the lag of log assets is 9.59. You want the world to know this. And so what do we do about it? There's a thing, so sometimes even when you run regressions, you're gonna to wanna to put it into Excel and eventually put it into Word you know, when you're writing your thesis and you're putting a table in a paper. The first thing you do is there's this thing called ESTSTO. Essentially, it's storing estimates. And this ESTSTO is essentially when you run a regression, you can save certain parameters into memory. And so this is me deleting that from memory. Before we actually talk about this EST post, let's actually just talk about tab stat. So tab stat is our way of tabulating our summary statistics in a way that's more customized and easier to read. So let's say we don't wanna take 
all of the variables that we have. We just want like total assets, LN total assets, illness days. We can just run tab stat, and it gives a, a bit of a prettier table like this. Now I'd say one disclaimer is we're getting into the into kind of the field where the code, like a lot of times with summarize and with like sorting and generating variables, you can kind of type that out on your own volition. But when you when it goes to tab stat, like for me in practice, I never like remember how to make summary statistics tables. I keep a do file of a time that I already made a summary stats table, and then I copy and paste it. And that's honestly what I encourage you to do. I don't encourage you to like memorize like how to type everything out, copy and paste it, and then make small changes to your to suit your needs. But the thing is, sometimes we want to get tabs th this table to an Excel file. And so let me show you. So what we can actually do is use this thing est post, which is essentially saving this s this tab stat thing that we're doing. It's saving it, and then est tab will be tabulating the saved estimates. Yes. Once we have that esto, it, what you see here is that it has this E in front of it, which means that it has been saved to this vector, this E vector, or this E min. So if you reference E min or E P5, that's that vector of these, va or of these values is going to be what that's referring to. With S post, then you have this thing called S tab using a particular file name that we're going to create, and it's going to have a bunch of these values. And so if we do that, okay, so it, it did it, and it says output written to this. And if we look at it, we can see, what we see here is now all of these have their own cells and all the parameters here and it'll have all the values. Now, just a few rules of thumb. Uh, you can do things like get rid of that. And you know, these are optional, like you can cut this and insert it here. But you know, a few, few key things, italicize variable names, maybe bold these, but that's not really the big issue. Like you, there's little details that you can deal with all the time in your own projects. But you know, big picture things, you know, you can modify such as getting a border here and maybe having like, you know, a, a lower border here. I mean, this is all completely like arbitrary. And then maybe, you know, something like a, a right border, like, you know, something like this. But the big picture is then you can copy it and paste it to something like Word. And you gotta make sure sometimes there could be some issues with formatting, so you have to be sure to pick uh, which one works for you. But this is the gist of it. And so sometimes, as we kind of talked about, we might want to look at subsamples. So for example, a subsample of Maybe we want to split our summary statistics between firms with negative returns and firms without negative returns. And so we might want to do this. So here we have two very nice looking tables where one is if negative ret is equal to one and if negative ret is not equal to one, where ideal if it was equal to zero. And so it will have all of these things that we have specified and so we can do that. So the if statement also allows you to filter, as we talked about earlier, summary statistics to work with. And now another one would actually be if we want to do it by industry. One, there's actually multiple ways you can use this function called by, or this option called by. So if I want to do, like if you want to do any function multiple times across values of a particular variable, you, do the, you use this thing called by. So for example, by SIC2, so for each value of SIC2, it's going to run the following multiple, so it's for each value. So we want to take tab stat of all of this. So what this is going to do is it's going to take the, it's going to tabulate all these variables and give all these things, 
but it's going to do it. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to act as if there's an if statement where it's if SIC equals this, and then it's going to repeat that for each SIC, and it's going to look like this. Well, it's going, to, it's going to look like this. It's going to say this because it's not sorted. So when it says not sorted on a by statement, you have two options. The first thing is you can sort SIC2 beforehand. You can do that. The way I like to do it is there's only one thing you need to do. There's one button you need to press to sort. There's by sorts. By sort was an updated version of by, so where you, instead of having to sort it yourself, you just type by sort. Or what I like to do is by s, same thing. So if you do by sort, it will sort by SIC2 and then run this. So for, it runs it for SIC equals 12, equals 40, 43, and 65, and 77. And now a couple other things. We talked about how in different industries there are different characteristics of firms. And in different years, there may be different characteristics of firms as well. So it may be the case that we want to use something as a benchmark. We may want to say, well, okay, we have this total firm size, but what is it relative to the firm size of the year? And so what you have to do is you have to calculate and save the firm size for the year. And now there are a lot of ways to do that. But the way that I like to do is there's this thing. So we have generate, right? You know, generate, and it creates a variable, and, you know, it, it does its thing. There is an extension of generate called egen. Let's say that for each year, we want to calculate the average of just total assets. With egen, what this does is this is called the extended generation function. So what that does is if you want to generate a variable that's a function of, of values of other variables, but across multiple observations. So like, let's say for like, we want to like sort year, for example. So we want to take the average, for example, of total assets for all firms in 2002. So because we're taking a function that is of multiple observations, we're going to be using egen, which you might also have to separately install, which we'll see. And so if I'm doing by year, and I want to, do, to create this variable called average size equals the mean of total assets, we use egen and not gen. But now when we have egen, we see that it's created this new variable with a different, with the same value within a year, because it's the average size within 2002, the average size within 2003, and so on. And so that's something that you're going to be wanting to do a lot. Sometimes in practice, uh, some researchers might take the total assets by industry and then subtract that from all of the assets of all the firms, for example. It might be the case that when you're standardizing a variable, you subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. So you might take the mean and then divide by the standard. You might subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, and now you got yourself a new variable. That's a thing. There's a lot of little nuances with egen, but that's the gist of it. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're going to be doing any kind of other like mathematical function that does not rely on additional observations, such as like ln total assets, you didn't need to do egen. When simply referencing other observations were like one at a time, you don't need to use egen. But when you are simultaneously taking a bunch of observations and putting them into a single function, like average, egen is something that you would need to use. One last thing that we might want to know is the correlation between different variables. Now, again, there's core and there's PW core. There's a lot of different correlation functions out there that do different things. The choice of using the one we're using is purely arbitrary. But sometimes you might want to do a correlation table, maybe just to please your readers, maybe just to show a to kind of diagnose some problems in a regression. But we have this thing called PW core. And let's say that we want to take the correlation of sales, total assets, and cash flow. We can see here it gives us a nice little correlation table, correlation between sales and log sales, 
correlation between sales and cash flow. And then these are T values that indicate the significance. And usually when it, you're given T values for correlations or even T values in summary statistics for any reason, you, what it is usually doing is it's doing a T test with the null hypothesis of that value equaling zero. So the null, for example, with these P values, this is essentially is negative 0.3222, could we say is this random or is this really the correlation not equal to zero? And so with a p-value of less than 1%, this is saying that this value, the, the correlation between sales and log sales is reliably not zero. So one more thing that we're going to do before we get out of here is understand how to plot figures. So another, uh, figures are another thing where you don't have to memorize the function. This is one of those you do it once, you forget about it for six months, and then you look up how to do it all over again when you need to do it, or copy and paste it from a do file. So there are a few different figures. I'll just show, uh, this, is, this is more for illustrative purposes on how it works. And so we can take a look. For example, there's graph two-way and there's histogram. For example, if we want to just take the relationship between average size and year, where year is the horizontal axis and average size is the vertical axis, we can actually take a graph two-way line of these two, we can set a title, and we can scale it and do all these things. So according to this data set, we have some wonky uh, stuff. We have, over time, there is a slow increase of firm size and then a large increase in 2020 or 2019. Now, one weakness of this is that it does not really acknowledge the differences in the number of observations. So right now, it's, we have a lot of observations. So each observation for each year, there's like some sort of like average. However, for 2019, for example, as you saw in the data set, we only had a single observation at 2019, and that has like a pretty weirdly large value of uh, total assets. And so that is an outlier that maybe you want to take out. And so it may lead to like a misleading result for the graph. There's also a histogram of total assets, which is more of a frequency distribution. And you can also kind of compare it to a normal curve. In this case, this is what that, if this were attempting to be a normal distribution, that curve is what it might look like. And as you can see with the histogram of total assets, this is not a normally distributed variable. And so we can kind of use that for diagnostic purposes. For example, if we were to say, like we wanted LN of total assets and kind of rerun that histogram, it might look a bit prettier. Qu not quite normal, but it's getting close. And lastly, you can have like a scatter plot if you want. Oftentimes we'll talk about like residuals and how like, you can look at a scatter plot to determine whether it, residuals are normally distributed or no, residuals are consistent across observations. But the point here is that this kind of graph may be more for diagnostic purposes. And so there are, these are a lot of the different types of things here. I want to just show you how the OLS, how running a regression works. So if I were to want to open this particular file. We're kind of clearing the board, new data, new stuff. The way that OLS regressions works is that it's going to be using this reg function. And so with the reg function, you're going to have the dependent variable first, and then all of your independent variables. And you run it, and it gives you an output that looks like this. So right now, we see that It'll give you, obviously, the variable name, the coefficient, standard error, but the ones you're going to look at the most are t-value and p-values, where low p-value is something that you like, high p-value, well, depending on your hypothesis, you may not like it. But we can see here that unemployment and sovereign rating are significantly negatively related to GDP per capita, while for political and financial crises, it's also negative but not quite as significant. The last things for this are actually talking about violations of assumptions of OLS regressions, because I know, and so there are going to be four of them. The first one is heteroscedasticity. Heteroscedasticity is essentially saying that variance is not constant. 
And so the way that we can test for it is, of course, we can first run this regression. And the nice thing about Seda is every time you run a regression, you're going to see this a lot today, it saves that, mo it acknowledges that most recent regression. So when you type estat het test, this does a test for heteroscedasticity. So the thing is, this runs a chi-squared test against the null hypothesis that it's constant variance. The p-value is 31% here, and so there's not really any issue with uh, heteroscedasticity. It says that, okay, we failed to reject the null saying it's constant variance, and so we can go on our merry way. However, if heteroscedasticity is an issue, so this is more of like a project slash exam information piece. This isn't something I consider to be practical. You can always include this VCE robust uh, standard errors. So what it does is it corrects for any potential heteroscedasticity, and it's made by some la a guy last name White, his standard errors. And notice here that when we include some sort of standard error correction, obviously it does not uh, affect the coefficients, but it does adjust the standard errors. So we do see that we have lost some significance for these dummy variables, but we've also gained significance for the unemployment and sovereign rating. So when we adjust for these standard errors, it's not, it's not unanimously it will always increase or will always decrease. Sometimes it increases, sometimes it decreases, but usually it'll change as we change our assumptions about the distribution of the residuals. For autocorrelation, what we will first want to do is essentially, with autocorrelation, it's the correlation of residuals across time. So we want to tell Stata, hey, here's our time variable, so keep that in mind. And so, again, we're going to run this regression, and then we're going to use this predict function. So I want to give you a little illustration of what the predict function actually is before I uh, go in and talk about the results. So what the predict function does is it essentially, you have this regression output of these coefficients. So what it does is it takes this coefficient, for example, this negative 0.003, multiplies it by its respective variable, adds it to this coefficient times this, and this times this, or this times this, and adds the constant to get a fitted value. And then what happens is you can, so that's what the predict does, is it gives you these values based on these values. Now the re residual is just the actual value minus the predicted value, and so it's that difference. And so when we predict those residuals, it essentially creates a variable of those residuals and that is this. And the thing about all correlation is the first thing we can do is actually take a look at what, what our uh, residuals look like. So autocorrelation is the correlation of residuals across time. So we can clearly see here that as in, in 1940, we see that a lot of the, cor the residuals are kind of moving together. They're kind of sticking together. They're doing their thing. So it's positively correlated. And then we see that they all go down together, and then they all go up together again. And so we say it like short-term lags, like a lag of one, we say like from 1940 to 1941, clearly a short-term positive correlation. Uh, if we were to say something like the lag of, let's say from you know, 1950, you know, 15-year lag, we will see like a, at 15 lags, it's actually negatively correlated. So always depending on the number of lags or the distance between two points in time, that will indicate like, okay, what's this correlation? But of course, you don't have to look at a graph because of course, graphs, interpretation, art, subjective, right? So of course, we have actual tests that can more mathematically illustrate autocorrelation. And so we might see something like, of course, as I mentioned, at the short term, this bar to the right indicates a positive autocorrelation. And we see that it's very strongly autocorrelated at one lag. And then we can kind of see that that positive autocorrelation shifts. It kind of dwindles, but it remains positive at longer lags and eventually becomes negative. And there's also a, another one called the Broch Godfrey test, where you can specify a number of lags to determine whether there is autocorrelation. In this case, there's clearly autocorrelation because the probability or the p the p value for the chi squared test is super zero. And so we can definitely see at five lags there is autocorrelation, and that's going to affect our result. And so we have this thing called the Newey function, where it's using Newey West standard errors to correct for autocorrelation at five lags. And so here you can trust that they have the same coefficients, but once again the standard errors change because we are accounting for autocorrelation. Now in practice, so I would say for your assignment when they say correct for autocorrelation, just do that. 
you're good. Uh, in practice, towards the end, we're going to talk about how uh, there's another regression function that solves all of these problems for you. So cool, cool. So multicollinearity is one of my favorites because I actually understand how it works. What happens with multicollinearity is let's, uh, the definition of it is you have multiple independent variables that are correlated with each other. And so let's look at a symptom of what multicollinearity could do. So we see, we take these two uh, regressions. We have one on GDP per capita on unemployment and one of GDP per capita on collinear. And we can see the coefficients are not only negative, but they're also very strongly significant. And so for me, I usually, I wouldn't like look at my coefficients with suspicion like that, but given that we know what's coming, you know, I'm a little suspicious. So what happens when you have strong multicollinearity problems is we see that when we put them together, first of all, their standard errors are about 10 times the size as they were before. They went from 0.0005 to just 0 0.005. We also notice that the coefficients changed where unemployment now actually has a much larger coefficient along with its much larger standard error, and collinear is positive and no longer statistically significant. And so what happens with multicollinearity is essentially you have this regression and it's just like, I can't tell which one of these variables is contributing to GDP per capita, so I'm gonna kinda throw something out there and give it a big coefficient of unemployment give a positive, uh, say collinear didn't really do it, but because I'm so unsure, I'm gonna really inflate these standard errors to tell the user, man, I'm not really sure about this. So that's what multicollinearity pretty much is. And so the way that we deal with multicollinearity is first identifying, is it a problem big enough to deal with? And so we have this thing called the variance inflation factor, VIF. Now in your lectures, you guys learned that I think it's around the value of 10, that it's a problem. Well, here it's 99 and a half, so we definitely know it's a problem. So the next thing we do is ask, what do we do about it? So if you want, you can also look at a correlation table to just see how correlated they are, and they're 99 and a half percent correlated. So of course we have a problem. So if we had more variables here, we could kind of dive deeper into this, but the solution to multicollinearity almost all the time is removing one of the variables. But then your question is, how do you know which variables to remove? So a couple ways to look at it. So in this situation, you have VIFs that are identical because you're only looking at two variables. But if you had more variables, usually their VIFs would vary a lot. And so one variable may have like way higher VIF than all of the others. And so you can easily pick to get rid of that one. Now in this case, uh, we could also think like, what about these variables may warrant one leaving and one staying. Well, for one, we know what unemployment is and we don't know what collinear is. And so we can easily use that to justify to get rid of collinear. Now, if you have two sensible variables and you still have this problem, well, you might think, well, unemployment seems to be behaving a lot more consistently while collinear kind of just jumped all over the place. So I don't trust collinear. So I'm gonna stick to keeping unemployment. And so that's always the issue is depending on the theory and all that stuff, when you're dealing with multicollinearity, you gotta delete a variable. The challenge is which one? And that's up to what your question is and what you're trying to do. Now the last thing is normality. Whenever you looked at like stock price paths in financial modeling, for example, in the simulations that were super fun, we always say the, the, the stock price follows a price path that is normally distributed with means, the standard normal distribution, normally distributed, mean zero, standard deviation one. Again, reminding that the standard deviation was constant and we are following a normal distribution. And so our errors are normally distributed. They also should be. Running this regression again and getting the residuals, we can take a look at the residuals and see what they look like. So this is what the res residual distribution looks like. So. What we see is we see a histogram and we see kind of a normal distribution line to see like what's this look like compared to normal. We see it's a little bit skewed to the right and there may be a little bit of kurtosis. So it looks kind of normal, but we don't know for sure. There's another kind of more informative plot known as the kernel density plot, which actually directly relates the red line, the normal distribution to the blue line with your distribution. You can see it's definitely much uglier. It's a bit beaten up. It's not perfect like normal distributions are. 
everyone always strives to be normal, but you're okay just the way you are. Except actually we have to do a statistical test on whether this is okay the way it is. So we do see that there's still that issue of uh, skewness to the right, and we see a little bit of kurtosis here. We do see some fat tail. But of course, it looks so close to normal. It, could it pass? Could it not? We don't really know. So that's why statistics comes to the rescue again. We have the skewness kurtosis test, gives us a result, says, okay, is this a problem? And it tells us maybe. Because now we see a p-value for null, is it not skew? 2% chance saying that, but essentially p-value of 2% on the hypothesis that there is no skewness and the 13% saying there is no kurtosis. So depending on what your critical values are, you would determine, okay, there's a normality problem or there's not. And then the joint test, of course, says, okay, if you want to just like put everything together, p-value is 3%. So with this sample size being so small, I would recommend a, a critical value of 10%. But with finance, you're going to have tens of thousands of observations. So your critical value can be 1%. But also, normality usually stops being a problem when you have a large enough sample size. Due to the central limit theorem, you are going, as the sample size increases, your residuals will converge to a normal distribution. So in finance, we usually don't worry about it. We usually also take the natural log of certain variables that we suspect might be extremely non-normal, such as total assets or market to book. Those are usually very non-normal, and so by default in finance papers, they won't, uh, they will just take the log, they will never explain or justify it because it's just standard. But if you go to your event study folder, you'll see you have three Excel files. If we're working in Stata and we wanna merge, Stata files, we have to make everything a Stata file first. So what we're going to do is we're going to just import each of these Excel files and save them as uh, Stata files. So that's what we're doing here. And so then now we're going to use the stock returns data. And what we want to do is merge it to the factor return data. So I'm going to slow down here because I want to talk about like, because a lot of times people have trouble like, oh my God, there are these three data sets. How the hell is this, does this work? Like, what are we doing? What variables? Like, do I do a one to many? Why is it not working? So I want to be very clear on like the thinking that goes behind merging, because merging can get dirty, and I want to make sure we do this as cleanly as possible. So taking a look here, we have stock return data, and the structure of it is that each firm has a perm number and a ticker, and each firm has multiple days, and for each day it has a return. We want to merge it, to the three factors. And so when we merge it with the three factors, the factor returns, we take a look and we see, okay, factor returns are actually kind of nice. It's just daily data, unique dates, with factor returns for each date. Very simple. So what we know is that, okay, if we want to merge with factor returns, we know that date is present in both the factor returns and the stock returns data. And so in stock returns, it is there are many of the same date and in the factor returns, there is one of the same date. So we're gonna do a many to one merge on date. When we do that, we see we're gonna merge many to one to date using the factor returns. And so you're gonna see something like this. You're gonna see a large amount matched and a weirdly precise amount non-matched. That's so nice, 24,600. It's always kind of comforting just to just purge all observations that don't match. But we want to take a look at why they're not matching, because sometimes we can find information on why it's not matching that may be within our control. So if we take a look, for example, here, we have you know, this pretty merge. We scroll down, and we see that the ones that are not matched, you can pretty easily tell why. Because the factor returns data goes back to like the 1920s, and CompuStat doesn't, or CRISP doesn't. And so, Essentially, it's just because the factor returns go so far, like absurdly far back in past that we just can't merge it. So I find we would kind of conclude, okay, well, that's a pretty good reason why they're not matched. We don't have to really fix anything, so we can just drop them and move on. So another thing we want to do is we see that the factor returns are actually in terms of percentages. So we see that like this is 0.39%. You know, we see 0.65%, minus 1.47%. And when we calculate things, we're gonna want it all consistently in decimal format. So we just essentially just divide them all by 100. Now it's some formatting stuff that's kind of a pain, 
but we have to deal with when we're dealing with CRISP, CompuStat, Excel, all these different programs and these different data sets that just don't seem to agree with each other. So we have to do something annoying. So returns, you can see, are a string. The reason why they're a string is because it's extremely, so here, you're gonna see that if a return is missing, it's replaced with a letter, and that letter is a code that you can find in words to explain why the return is missing. And so that makes the entire variable a string, and we don't like that. Remember when we talked about how f like firm identifiers were strings and we needed it to be a number, and we used encode? We do not do that here, because encode is specifically for like categorical variables that we just need to make a number for the sake of like factoring and categorizing. This we actually need to calculate with returns, so we're not gonna encode it. We're gonna turn it into a number. So we do that by this thing called destring. So when we destring it, what it does is, if it contains non-numeric characters, it just changes it to missing. So that observation that was a B is now missing, and all the returns are numbers. So now we can do some calculations with it when we need to. Because return is our main variable that we are going to be calculating stuff on, we want to just drop anything where return is blank. And the same thing with, because we're going to eventually merge on ticker, which I wanted to say right now is a very bad idea in practice, but we'll talk about that later. And so we're going to save this stock and factor returns data file. So now we've merged the stock and we've merged the, the factor returns. So we have daily stock data for a bunch of firms and we have the factors that are for each day. So now what we got to do is take a look at the M&A deals. So this can get messy, and this is a bit messy with this particular example. We're going to use M&A deals, and taking a look here, we have a lot of variables. I'm going to just get rid of a lot of the variables that we don't really need so we can have kind of a cleaner look. So we take a look here, and notice in the previous data set, we had a variable date, and we had a variable ticker, right? And so at some point, what we want is we want the date variable and the kind of the firm variable to line up and have the same, be treated as the same variable. We see in this M&A deals file that the date is not called date, but it's called announced date. And the ticker symbol is called acquirer ticker symbol and not just ticker. So if we're going to merge this to our stock and factor returns, we have to do some like renaming where we essentially just want to rename acquire ticker symbol to ticker and rename announce date to announcement. And so lastly, we have this deal value. This is, uh, we're going to drop some uh, blanks, but this is an example of in some databases sometimes missing values are not denoted as missing. In this case, if we were to say drop if deal value was blank, it wouldn't drop anything because all blank values are denoted as NA. So NA is a value that's not blank. And so you have to tell it specifically drop NA. Taking a look at our data, let's, let's actually sort. So our only firm identifier in the stock and factor returns and in the M&A deals is ticker. And so we see that in, M &A, in the stock and factor returns, we had the same ticker for many days to count those, retur those returns for many days. Here, for M&A deals, we, have, we essentially care about deal number. We want each deal to be represented. The thing is, unfortunately, you know, CRISP doesn't have deal number. They don't care about M&A. They care about firms. And so the thing is, Apple has multiple deals. But there are many of the ticker symbol, same ticker on the first file, and we see many of the ticker on this file. And so... Like, saying many-to-many -many merge just feels natural, but it's wrong. You don't do a many-to-many -many merge. You never do a many-to-many -many merge. So, we're going to use join by. It works very similarly to merge. It's data, combined data sets, and it's going to be form all pairwise combinations within groups. So, essentially, for each instance of Apple, for example, it's going to match all the returns with Apple with each individual deal with Apple. And so when we do that, we have ourselves a nice gigantic data set of 130,000 observations. So now we have our merged data set, and it's messy, it's big, but we know it works. 
So essentially now we have it for each deal, we have the full stock return history for the of related firm and we have the factor returns for that specific day. So we have a lot of stuff to work with. But now we want to sort this data set by perm number and date. Usually the default sorting you want all the time is by the firm variable and the date variable. So now we have our big data set. If the world ends, we at least have our dear master file. So a nice thing about opening files is sometimes you have a lot of these ugly variables we don't care about. But if you want to open a file and only keep some variables, you can do that. Now we're going to talk about something that was a huge pain for some people is dates. So we have ourselves two dates. We have a date and we have an announcement date. So what we want to do is essentially compare the current date for each deal to the announcement date because essentially we're going to identify the announcement date for each stock return piece of information and then we're going to also identify the dates like what for each day with stock return information how many days before or after the event is this observation. Now the issue is we can't make much of a comparison if the dates are in different formats. Because according to Stata, this is 2 million one, or 2 million 19,102 or 100. It's a big number. That's all they care about. Where here, it's a date. I mean, it's format as percentage sign TD. We want to get that. And so what we do is when you want to convert a number to a, to a date, the thing is, this 2019 or 02 makes sense, but Stata sees it as a number. So to really get it to know what we're talking about, we have to say, okay, this is a string. The specific characters and the order that they are matter. We're not doing math. This is information. And so now when we have information, we can use the date function. So we can take this string, this 2019-0104, and say, okay, we want to generate a date. And the, f and the thing is, this option is the format that this string is in is year, month, day. And so when we generate this string, or generate this date, a couple things happen. First, it, tr it changes into a five-digit number that we can't really interpret. The second thing is it is no longer a string. It is an actual number. So now it's converted this into a number. It's like, okay, I'm Stata, and this is how I see dates. Big numbers. Deal with it. And so the way we deal with it is we change the format. We, we want to look at it in a way that humans can understand. So we change it to this percentage sign TD format. And so now we have the day, the month, and the year. Just like this. What we have is now we have some dates. What we want to do now is we want to figure out how to identify the observations in which the date from the CRISP data, so the return data for CRISP, is the same date as the announcement. That's the first thing we want to do. And we want to label it in a way that we can use. So here's what we do. We're going to sort by deal number and date because we want to make sure all the deals are together and the dates are in order. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate this thing called date number. So what it's going to do is by deal number, so within each deal, what it's going to do is it's going to take that first, the earliest date, and give it a value of one. It's going to go to the next date and give it a value of two and three, and four, and so on. And that's what this, lower, this underscore lowercase n is, is the observation number within a group. So if we have this variable, what it does is it, it starts counting. It counts all the way to like 500, and then we see that if it switches firms, the counter will restart. So now this is the earliest date in this firm's data, and so on. And so... Now we're going to have this thing called target. What we're going to do is we're going to create a variable where the only v observations that have a value are the observations where the date for, from CRISP or from the stock returns equals the date of the announcement. And so now we have this variable target, and it's mostly blank, except on the announcement date. It has a value, in this case, of 113. And so when it has this value, we're going to create another variable with egen. We're going to take the minimum by deal number. So the minimum of this particular deal is the only one with a value, which is 113. So now we have a variable that's 113. 
So now what we want to do is we want to make it so we have a variable where the announcement date equals zero, the days before are negative values one, two, three, and the days after are positive values one, two, three. For example, we want this day, this day here, to be zero. We want this day to be one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. The way we do that is we make another variable where we subtract this target date number from the date number variable. And so what it's going to happen is we're going to get a variable that looks like this. So this is date diff, the, date, the difference between the, at, the date of the return that we're looking at and the date of the announcement. And so when we say on the corporate finance project, we want a minus five, positive five window, that means that our event window needs to have these observations. And so keep in mind, these are five trading days before and five trading days after, so weekends are skipped. Taking a, a pause here, and we're thinking, okay, well, we just got our days related to the event date in order. So what do we do with this? What are we doing? Why are we doing this? So what we need is two things. We need an event window. We need a, a window of time around an event that we say, okay, this is related to the event. We also need an, was an estimation window. We say, okay, this is a window of time that we believe is representative of normal times of the firm that we're going to estimate expected returns with. And so what we need to do is essentially identify the event window and the estimation window by essentially making a dummy variable for the event window if it's within two days and a, a dummy variable for the estimation window if it's between minus 60 and minus 30. And so we see here that for my, between minus 60 and minus 30, we have a dummy of one for the estimation window and between minus two and positive two, we have a event window here. Unfortunately, it's not perfect data. For not, not every deal is gonna have a full estimation window or a full event window. And so it's also a pretty large data set. And so we wanna kind of trim it down if we can. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get rid of any deal where the event window or the estimation window is not as big as it needs to be. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna e-gen a few things where we're gonna go buy each deal and we're gonna count how many, uh, we're gonna take the sum of all these dummies to say how many days of an event window do we have for this deal and how many days of an estimation window do we have for this deal. And we will see that some of these, for example, this one has the full event window but it doesn't have enough data backwards to have you know, a full month from minus 30 to minus 60. And so it actually doesn't even go to minus 30. So what we're gonna do is based on these variables, if it has not enough event observations or estimation window observations, we drop those deals. So that gets rid of about 25,000 observations. Okay, yeah, we've trimmed the sample. We're now gonna keep only what we are using. Now that we have our, that's all the data cleaning and data prep stuff. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna construct variables that we actually need. So we've identified our estimation window, we've identified our event window. So now what we gotta do is two things. We have to, at the end of the day, we need to calculate if the returns in our event window are abnormal returns against our expectations. The thing we have to do first is we have to calculate what those expectations are. So what we're gonna do is we have to deal with the estimation window. So we're gonna create an expected return in a residual variable real quick. And there's this thing called levels. So levels is what you do when you want to list a unique, val like each unique value of deal number. But more importantly, not just if you wanna look at how many unique deals there are in this vast world of M&A deals, but if you want to save those and use them for a loop. The thing is, levels is something that gets saved in a scalar, and it's gonna be, you can reference it via R of levels. And so in this loop, it's gonna be for each I, or for each one of these in levels, you're gonna do all this stuff. Now before we talk about what all this stuff is, I wanna zoom in and show you something important. So look at this I real quick. So 
we are so we rep, we created this very this hidden like macro variable called i for when we said for each for each i and so what we're going to do is like it's going to loop and it's going to make i equal this variable then this variable or or this value then this value and the thing is when we cite i what we are we need to do is you can't just type i and more importantly you can't just type quote i there's a very specific thing that you have to do. You need to type on the left side, I don't know the actual name of it, I call it like reverse hypo or apostrophe. It's the thing on the top left of your keyboard right under the tilde if you don't press shift. That's what you, that's, I think this is the only time I've, in my entire life I've ever had to press that key. But on the right side, it's a normal single quote. And so what it's gonna do is it's gonna run a regression on the returns on the market risk premium if the deal is that particular deal, and it's in the estimation window, because we're only going to use the observations in the estimation window to estimate the beta of that firm. And so then we're going to use that beta to calculate the expected return. So after we calculate that, again, it's going to save those betas, or, the, or that beta for that deal number. So we're going to use predict to predict the return if the deal number is, again, the deal we're looking at. Then we're going to predict the residual, and then we're going to replace the expected return with the return predicted by the, uh, the model, and then we're going to replace the residual by the residual based on the model. It's going to run, you're going to click it, and it's going to do this, and it's kind of satisfying when you run a really complicated loop for yourself. You see all the changes that are happening, and then you're like, oh, hey, cool, uh, it's doing stuff. And then three days later, it says end of do file. Uh, and so now when we look, we have uh, expected return and residuals, but again, they're only for the event window. Because what we just did is we calculated the betas for the firms and then used those betas except based on the market risk premium of the particular dates in the event window. And so the abnormal returns here are the residual, or you know, in this code, it pretty much just recalculates it anyway. But the thing is, once we took those residuals, what we did was then we calculated a cumulative abnormal return. What we did was we took the sum of all of the non-missing abnormal return values, which were only the values for the uh, estimation window. We took the sum, and now we say this is the cumulative abnormal return within the event window for this deal. So now we have the cumulative abnormal return for the entire deal. So it's negative 0.04%, not, nothing crazy. Now what we want to do is we have this value, but of course it's hard to estimate what, or to kind of judge whether this value is important unless we take a significance test. We get a good old t-test in here, and we can have a good old time with it. The way we're going to do this is, of course, sort deal number and date in the event that, like, that hasn't happened yet. And let's go back to the top. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the standard deviation of the abnormal returns. And we have that standard deviation for a particular deal. Now, let me be very clear. So remember in financial modeling, when you had to take the standard deviation of monthly data, and then you had to annualize it. Well, we had 12 months per year, and we wanted to make it an annual standard deviation. So we took it by, the, we multiplied the square root of 12. This is the same way. We have five annual return or abnormal returns per deal, and we want to make that a just a cumulative abnormal return standard deviation. So what we do is because we're taking it from a variable with five and condensing it into one, we're going to take the standard deviation of abnormal returns, multiply it by the square root of five. And then lastly, to actually get the t-test against the null that it's that the cumulative abnormal return is zero. We're going to divide the cumulative abnormal return by its standard deviation, and this is the variable we get. We get a t-test, and each t-value, it's assigned one t-value per deal. It's going to go all the way down here. So this is essentially what we've been looking for. So I just want to kind of reiterate what we did. We essentially merged all the data together. We calculated each day whether it was the event or whether it was a day before, a day after, two days before, two after. We estimated a beta for the firm using an estimation window. We use that beta to calculate the expected return for the days within the event window. 
we compared the expected returns with the actual returns in the event window, and then we took the sum, divided it by the standard deviation to get a t-value. And so you can use the list function to look at them all like pretty and one at a time if you want. You can see the cumulative abnormal return here and then the t-value here, and you can see it's, it's quite the mess. It's so what we're going to do now is we're going to actually export it to Excel and do a final significance test uh, to determine whether the average cumulative abnormal return is or is not zero. So I just want to uh, point out a few things. The reason why we're using Excel is because it's easier to illustrate and also it would prevent us from having to e-gen like 20 other variables. But also notice that we are doing this conditional. We are only exporting if the date difference equals zero because we can see in the data set that we only need one cumulative abnormal return and one T value for each deal. And so we don't need to have this repeated like 500 times. So we're only going to take it if the event date is zero, just so we don't have those duplicates. So if we export it and open it and take a look, this is the file you should get, not this, but this. Uh, so this is essentially the same thing, except now we're going to test the significance of the, all of the cumulative abnormal returns. So what we're going to do is you take the average of the cars, you then take the standard error of this by essentially taking, essentially you take the variance of each of the standard deviations or by squaring them. And then you do some fancy thing where you add all the variances and then divide it by n squared. And then you get the standard deviation by taking the square root and your T statistic for this single event study is 4.6 which indicates that there is a pot, there's statistical evidence that there is a positive relationship between whether there's a merger and abnormal returns within two days of the event. One thing that we have not covered is rolling returns, which I think is something that is of special interest to a lot of you. But there is a specific way that's not particularly too crazy to do it in Stata. But just to get everyone up to speed on exactly what rolling returns are, it's essentially if you have monthly data, for example, it could be daily, it could be anything, and you say, I want annual rolling returns month by month. What that means is that, for example, at this month, the returns of the last 12 months will be compounded and brought up to this month. If you go to the next month, it will be the previous 12, but not that one, just it'll move this window up by one and then uh, move it up by one, and so on. So you have annual return measure for the last 12 months for each month. A couple things to keep in mind on what is required in that process is you're going to have a raw return. It might be negative, it might be positive, but uh, you need to compound it. So remember from investments, and I think every finance class you've ever taken, when you want to compound uh, returns, you have to add one first. So you add one, and then you take the product of all of them, and then to get the actual return value, you subtract one at the end. So conveniently, there's, there's a function that does that all for you in one line. So when we take a look at AS roll, well, first of all, we have to install it. So make sure that you do that. Once that's installed, we see it's a one liner thing. So I'm going to kind of walk through what each thing means. So we're taking AS roll. We're going to do a rolling return. So we're going to do rolling based on the variable return. So when we do that, we have to specify what exactly are we doing when we're rolling it? Are we adding them? Are we subtracting them? Uh, and in this case, we're actually taking the product. It's possible also to do minimum, maximum, other things. But in this case, we're just going to multiply them by each other. And because this was made by a finance person, they expect you to make rolling returns. And so they include this add option, which essentially not only adds the one at the beginning, but subtracts it at the end. So it does all the work for you. Then it's going to ask what variable name you want to generate. And then what's the window we're working with here? Are we doing, you know, minus six plus six, something else? In this, it's no. We're going to start, we're going to end today, and we're going to do the last 12 months. And to, it, because the person writing this also knows that crisp kind of sucks and it has a lot of gaps, it also allows for a minimum option to say, okay, well, there's got to be at least 12 months in these monthly annual returns so we need at least 12 months. And so if we don't have 12 months, it's going to be missing. And then, of course, we don't want to include rolling returns of different firms. So we want to make sure that each firm is done individually. That is what this AS roll is. It's very smooth, very nice. 
no big problems like back in the day. And it's almost instantaneous. And we see here we have our 12 month return. The first 11 are missing for each firm, but otherwise we have a pretty solid rolling return base. And now uh, we want, again, when we're merging by QSIP, we want to make sure that we drop any kind of QSIP codes. And so we want to save this stock data. So what we're going to do now is we're going to import CompuStat data. And I think it's important to point out some of the, the subtle differences between them and why it's relevant. QSIP or date is called date and QSIP has eight digits in the crisp data. However, when we open the CompuStat data, we have a couple things. First, date is not called date, it is called data date, and QSIP is actually nine digits instead of eight. And so if we want to merge by QSIP date, we do have to do a couple things. The first thing we need to do is change data date to just be called date, because if we're going to merge by a date variable, we want to make sure that it's comparing the same variable. But also if we're going to be comparing QSIPs and you merge an eight digit with a nine digit, you're going to have a lot of non-matches, and that's going to not do you wonders for your dating profile. So um, with QSIP, you, we want to actually bring that down to eight digits, not nine. The way we do that is we do this thing called substring, where essentially you just indicate you have a string and you just want a part of that string. And so we're indicating that we want QSIP to become a substring of the variable QSIP, starting at, and we want it to start at uh, position one, so the first character, and we want it to be eight characters long. So when we do that, we now see that our variable is now eight digits long. And for, and we want to again drop missing QSIPs, and we want to rename data date to date so it is in line with the crisp data. Now, the thing is with duplicates, I'm going to just show you what you want to do. So at some point, we want to do a one to one merge on date and QSIP. So what happens is a lot of you guys get errors when you're merging. You're saying, okay, uh, variable date is not uniquely identified in the master data or something like that is what you've probably seen before. So to avoid that error, what we want to do is we want to actually investigate are there non-unique values of date and QSIP that we need to account for. So what we do is we use this thing called duplicates and then we do duplicates tag. So what duplicates tag does is it marks any possible, any duplicates in the, in the data. And we uh, specify by what criterion. So we want to make sure there are no uh, QSIP date duplicates and then generate a variable called dupe to, to account for that. And so very quickly what you can do is you can type count if dupe is greater than zero to say, okay, if there is a duplicate, it will be marked with the number one. However, if, there are, if there's more than one duplicate, then it will be marked with two or three and so on. So we're going to count if dupe is greater than zero. And we see that there's actually 6,142 observations that are associated with duplicates. So the impulse to do are one of two things. The first is to use the duplicates function to drop the duplicates. That's not the worst thing. The worst thing you do is just drop everything where dupe is greater than zero. That's a problem. When you see duplicates, it's important to, uh, to look at your data and see why are there duplicates, what's happening here. So you go into your data browser and you know, we want to take a look at what are these observations where there are duplicates. So we want to filter to say, okay, dupe is greater than zero. If we go to this filter, It'll only show us the observations that, that, that pertain to this particular thing. So we apply this filter. We have all of our 6,000 where we have a dupe value. So here's the deal. Taking a look at these observations, we see, okay, we have the same date on the same F year or the same QSIP. And we see here where the differences are. So we hit, see a duplicate because it seems that it wanted to put an observation for each industry format, as you can see here. Now, the thing is, if you just drop everything that's dupe equals one, well, you're dropping both of them, when in reality, you need to drop one of them. The other issue is that we see here, like especially this here, or, well, this here, that one of the duplicates has a value for total debt and another one doesn't. 
So when you drop duplicates, you have to be sure that you're dropping the one that has less information because some, a lot of times it will be this case where one observation has information and another observation of the same firm year has nothing. Usually there's some way to tell, like there's a lot of different ways you can go about deleting the missing. Uh, you could, but I'll just show you, you know, it's just one right now. It's, it, you can pretty much tell that all of the missing observations are associated with, well, first of all, all the duplicate observations and all the missing observations are associated with this industry format FS. So what you could do is just do drop if dupe is greater than zero and industry format equals FS, and it'll drop some observations. So what you can do is then go back, re-tag the duplicates, to check if there are any. And so it seems that once we dealt with that situation, we don't, we no longer have any duplicates left. So we were able to preserve the observations that were duplicates, but had information while getting rid of the ones that had missing information. All right, so that's dealing, so dealing with duplicates is something you're gonna deal with constantly when you're working with Crisp and CompuStack because they have these restatements. They just throw in extra observations or maybe they will re remove random ones. And so that's a tricky thing that's really annoying to deal with. So now that we've kind of removed the duplicates, we can merge one to one by QCIP date. And we have this situation, which is perfectly normal. So what we did was we merged, uh, so we had taken the rolling returns, right, for each month. What we did was we merged only the months that match the specific months in CompuSat, because CompuSat has a date, it's a monthly date, or it's an, it's an annual date, but it indicates the month. And so to be precise, we, want to, we wanted to just merge whatever month in the rolling returns with whatever month the statement is specified in CompuStat. And so seeing 20,000 match observations in an annual sample, that's pretty standard. So 20,000 is a pretty solid number, very common, uh, pretty good size sample to work with. So again, I'm against just haphazardly dropping if merge one and merge two are or if merge is one or two, always check, but for the sake of time, we're just gonna drop them. And there's something that I wanna point out to you. If you have a, a date in Stata, you can also specify year and month functions in order to deter, just give out the year or the month. So one thing that someone asked, and a lot of you probably noticed, is sometimes the fiscal year does not end in December. Sometimes you'll see that the date in Stata is May instead of December. Most of them are in December. How, and so this is a common problem because a lot of firms do not have their fiscal year end in December. And so what happens is if you calculate a rolling return and say you want data for just 2015, if the fiscal year end month is December, cool, you got January 2015 to December 2015. Bad news is that if you have a fiscal year end month of May, then all the data that's labeled 2015 is actually June 2014 to May 2015. And so when you're calculating only return for the year 2015 in CRISP, that's not gonna perfectly align with all the stuff that's in CompuStat. So that's actually one reason why we kind of did this rolling return thing. And so, but in practice, the thing is, we are going to just, and for this particular thing, we're gonna drop anything where the fiscal year end month is not 12, just for simplicity, just to go on with our lives. And even for your thesis, it's probably not a big deal. But if you do see that your sample needs to be larger, then it would be worth investigating, how, looking at how to work around the fiscal year end month differences, because it is something that does matter, especially if you're gonna be an actual professor in real life or do this like professionally and beyond the thesis. Quintiles. It's like, hey, run this regression for the top 20% of firms in this category. And so there's this thing called AS tile. What we want to do, and so we're going to first calculate the market capitalization of the firm. And so we want to go over here. We have this market cap thing. So what we want to do is if we want to say we want the top 20% of the market cap per year, essentially we want to break these market caps into quintiles on a yearly basis and create a dummy variable that indicates this firm is in the top 20% for its year. So what we do is we use this AS tile thing. And so we do AS tile and there's the variable names we call quintiles. 
and we're going to do it by market cap. Now, the thing is the option NQ is five. That means we're going to break it into five groups. If we did it in four, we would break it into quartiles. If we did it by 10, it would be deciles, you know, uh, just the 10, 10 groups of the highest to lowest. And then, of course, we want to do it by date because we don't want to do it by the entire sample. We just want to say, I want the top, like the top 20% per year. So when we run that, we take a look, and we now have our quintiles variable where for each year we have whether it is among the lowest 20% or among the highest 20%. And so all you have to do is then generate a dummy variable conditional on quintiles being equal to five and making it zero for those where quintile is not five. So if you were to run a regression, say with an interaction effect to say, hey, I want to run this regression on how sales impacts leverage for the top 20% of firms, you can have now this top 20% dummy interacted with sales on leverage. All right, so looking at pa panel. So panel, what this is going to do is we're going to work, going to work with a panel data set. And we are going to do some regressions and talk about some of the results and how to interpret and what we can do about it. So we have this panel data set. We have a firm number. Each firm has multiple years. And we have total assets, cash, all this stuff. And we have whether the country is German or French. And so we know how to do our standard OLS regression. We have our results. We have our coefficients, our statistically significant stuff. What we don't know about is how to do an interaction effect. The deal with interaction effects is when you have an interaction effect with variable A and variable B and you run a regression, the way that you have to have it done is you have to have variable A and variable B in the regression and variable A times variable B as well. We can actually shortcut that with these two hash signs. So with these two hash signs, what it does is it takes size and country dummy, what, and it says, okay, I'm going to put size in the regression, and I'm going to put country dummy in the regression, and then I'm going to put size and country dummy multiplied together in the regression. However, if you do it like this, you're going to get an error because it's going to say something like size, the factor variables may, contain, may not contain non-integer values, and sometimes with non-integer values, you have to kind of communicate with Stata. So it's kind of like Stata's confused. I mean, it was expecting size to be an integer, and size is continuous. Size is a decimal. It's a double. And Stata's having a hard time coping with that. So you need to communicate with Stata, and you need to give it that support to say, you know what, you have to accept the fact that size is continuous. I mean, we can't do this regression without you realizing this. And then when you have that conversation with Stata by putting C dot in front of size and you run the regression, then it's like, okay, I'll accept size is in fact continuous. And then it does the regression. And so you have your size coefficient, you have your country dummy, and then you have your coefficient. That is the interaction. There are two hashtags, but there's also the option for one hashtag. And I cannot tell you any reason why you would ever do one hashtag. But what that does is essentially it will... Uh, keep the interaction effect, but it will not include the size or the country dummy. So let's talk about fixed effects. So there's a lot of different ways to do them uh, because there are, as you'll see, there's a lot of different regression functions. We're just going to talk about how you can implement fixed effects and what they look like. So when you want to implement a fixed effect, you put I dot and then the variable. And again, I think it's going to do, it might do something similar with uh, if you do like a continuous variable, it's also going to do the same thing uh, where it's going to give you a problem. And you cannot, I don't think you can remediate or fix it by just putting C dot. But with year, it's a, it's a integer variable where if you do I dot year, what happens is it will then include each year as its own dummy variable. And then alongside the size and all that stuff. And for firm fixed effects, same thing. You do I dot firm number. And, well, clearly there's a lot of firms, and so you might not really want to have all of those things listed, all those coefficients for all 300 firms. And you'll also notice and with the COVID dummy, an issue here. So with this country dummy, it's not super clear. Essentially, the country dummy is omitted. The reason being is because for the firm fixed effects, there is a dummy variable for pretty much every single firm that takes place in Germany. And so pretty much 
it would mean that the, the country dummy already is redundant because all of its different firms in that country are already taken. And so in this particular situation where like you have a dummy variable for the year equals 2020 or above 2020, what happens is when you do time fixed effects, the year 2020 or the, maybe the year 2020 and 21 also for the uh, year fixed effects will be omitted because of multicollinearity. Now to be very clear, that's not a bad thing. That's not a problem. It's not like what it literally means is, okay, well, we were going to do fixed effects on 2020, but it seems like this variable you have here already has done it. So we don't need to do it again. That's what that means. It doesn't mean that you messed up and that your specification is bad and that you broke stata and that you're a failure. It just means, hey, you already did its work for it. Don't worry. And so as we covered last time, we talked about this XT or we talked about TS set. And XT set is very similar. XT set is essentially one that's, I think it's a bit faster and it's updated, but it's also meant to be used with certain regressions. XT set lets us again communicate with Stata that, okay, the firm number is the, is the panel or it's the firm thing. And we have the year is the time. And we talked about leads and lags where if you tell Stata what the firm and the year is, it's pretty smart with generating lead and lag variables. As you can see, it for each new firm, it's not going to have the first observation or the last observation with a lag or a lead. But now this is the part where this actually becomes super practical and so are and like actually useful. So I just want to first illustrate to you the differences. There are multiple different regression functions that you will use, or you will probably just use one the whole time, but there are many different that you can use. For example, let's say that you, you have that regular regression of leverage on these variables and you have these year and these firm uh, fixed effects. You know, you see that it has this huge, or a huge thing with all the fixed effects and we do see it has its fitted values. However, we have these things called AREG and XTREG, which are a bit more complex and allow us to have some kind of flexibility here. You, can, you still have to uh, run the regression as normal and have your I dot year, but you can actually specify absorb, which is another way of doing firm fixed effects, just it won't like spit out all of the uh, coefficients or the, yeah, the year coefficients on you or the firm coefficients on you. And so you can actually do essentially the same thing. With XTREG, what it does is instead of saying absorb firm number, you can just specify FE. And fixed effects, it's just, okay, firm fixed effects. I know what the firm is because you did it in XT set. We got the fixed effects. Go for it. We're all good. And then you can predict the fitted values as well. And so we see that we get the fitted values. And AREG and XTREG pretty much give the same fitted values. I mean, with, from the normal reg, it's a little different. But between these two, it's more of a matter of preference. I would honestly say XTREG, I think, is usually, I think, what Marno suggests and what he uses. Now, if you want to test for autocorrelation in panel data, because remember, you did TS set year or XT set year. And the thing is, in, when we did that for autocorrelation in the OLS, it was kind of like a one year at a time, pretty small data set. When we want to test for autocorrelation in panel, we, and we've already done the XT set, there's a thing called XT serial. But we do have to install it. So this is some packages, as I may have said last time, uh, it's not super easy to install. For example, if I run this to try to install XT serial, it'll give an error saying that it's not found. Uh, conveniently, if you ever search for a package in Stata and it says that it's like not found and you search it instead, it'll give you essentially a, these packages. Well, technically this one's called XT serial, but actually apparently the actual XT serial function is found in this thing called ST0039, as we can see here. And then you can install it and it'll do its thing and it'll be fine. So sometimes, yeah, it's like the, the name of the package is not the same as the name of the function and sometimes you have to actually look for it. But once we have XT serial, we can just take a, we don't have to specify the number of lags. We can just say, in this regression, uh, is there serial correlation? And it says, of course there is. And now we're thinking, oh my God, what do we do about autocorrelation? We got to, we got to use those Newey West errors, right? So you remember all that heteroscedasticity stuff we were talking about, the autocorrelation, solving it with our own crazy new methods and our crazy standard errors. 100% of the regressions in my stuff I've ever done looks like this. So you take XTREG, you do your regression, you have your fixed effects, and you have your VCE cluster on firm, 
And what it does is essentially clustering by firm is the same as calculating the robust standard errors. So, okay, you don't have to worry about heteroscedasticity. And when you have all these fixed effects, you don't have to care about autocorrelation. And so it'll say, like, we have these robust standard errors and all this stuff. So in practice, you just do that and you're fine. So one thing that's kind of nice is there's a lot of different, also a lot of different ways to, to actually put your output out there. So you can run a regression. Again, magic of Stata is it saves all the regression outputs. It saves your betas. It saves everything, everything. And so what you do is you use Outreg2, which you also will have to install. And so when you run this regression, you can do Outreg2. So for example, let's, let's just do the first regression, and it's going to give you an output. It's not, and so what happens is we have this first regression. It has a column. It has its little details. But we can continue running these others, and what we see is we have this append thing. So what happens is if we save it to the same Excel file, it's just going to add an additional column with all of these details. So what we can do is we can continue running all of these and then take a look at the, uh, at the Excel file. And we can see that it is now has five columns of all these regressions, and it's really pretty. Like, look, it has the, the, the borders. It has, like, whether it's firm fixed or time fixed effects. It has the stars. It has the standard errors, which you're welcome to change the T values if you want. Like, it's nice. You barely have to change anything. You maybe have to, like, italicize some variables, like, change these to sensible names, center some stuff. But it it's, looks great. It almost looks paper quality. And so, again, that function is outreg2. But let's take a look at the Fama Macbeth data. So we see that we have monthly data for some arbitrary firms, and we have, for each month, a particular return for that firm. And each month we also have but yeah, particular returns for these factors. Or not returns, but magnitudes of these factors. So with a Fama Macbeth regression, and so we have this data. It's not ugly at all. We want to make sure that when we do XT set, remember we talked about encoding the firm to, go, to get it from a string into a number so we can categorize it. One, two, three, and all that. And so we're going to do Fama Macbeth twice. It's so nice in this data. We're going to do it twice. The first thing we want to do is, for each firm, we want to calculate each firm's beta. We're going to generate this beta variable and take levels by firm number. And we see that there are 20 firms based on the firm number variable from the encoding. So now, again, for each firm in these levels, we're going to regress the market return, or the return on the market for that particular firm. And then, one big thing to note is this. We're going to take the coefficient of that regression and save it as the beta for the firm. So that's the nice thing about Stata. Again, you run a regression. It saves the coefficients in these scalars. And then you just do underscore B in brackets, the variable name. It takes that variable's coefficient, and you can use it however you want. And so what it's doing is it's going to save the betas to that beta variable. And it's going to look like this. So we have beta for firm AA. We have beta for firm BA, BAX, all that. And so for the Fama Macbeth regression, you install XTFMB. And all you do is XTFMB, return as a dependent, beta as the independent. And you got yourself your two steps. It does it all for you in like a second. But if you want to do it with a three-factor model, go ahead. It's not that hard. Uh, compare, I mean, once you know how to do it, like, okay, like, we generated the market beta, and then we took the betas, then we ran it. You generate three variables instead, and then you regress it once. You just save each coefficient to its own variable, and then you run the regression again. And then we were able to just get these coefficients and then just throw it in a Fama Macbeth function, and then it just does it. And it's just, that's crazy. This is technology, man. Uh, so with binary, essentially the way that binary works is it's essentially your uh, one thing, as you may have learned, when it comes to binary variables, is that if it's a binary dependent variable, you cannot just use OLS on it. Because as you may have met, gone over in the lectures, like, OLS does not assume that the dependent variable is bounded between 0 and 1, so it may predict 
uh, negatives or above zero and the, the variance won't work and it's just not a good time. The, what we have are two different regression types. We have probit and we have logit. And so probit and logit unfortunately do not have the same interpretation as OLS, where OLS is for every increase of one for this independent, y will increase by this value. With probit and logit, it's a lot of crazy kind of uh, probability stuff. So you could still do probit result. So essentially the data set is, essentially we have a result of whether they passed or failed an exam. We have their average grade, we have their gender, and whether they are a good student, okay, poor, or they just don't exist. And so essentially what we wanna do is, so these are all binary variables. When you're doing probit and logit, as me be very clear, the independent variables do not have to all be binary, but if the dependent variable is binary, you do have to do it. So if you are doing like a, whether or not a, or a firm pays a dividend as a dependent, you're gonna be used, uh, most of the time using logit. That's an example. So in a probit regression, what we see is that it takes a bit longer to calculate. It's, it uses an iterative process. It's not a quick equation. It has to kind of figure it out. And so with these uh, coefficients, the, the thing that's tricky about probit is that the coefficients actually kind of depend on what the other values, uh, other coefficients are. Because what it is, is this is not taking a value, like this is not saying that a, an increase of average grade of one increases anything by 85%. That's not what this is saying, because then this just wouldn't make any sense. Um, so what this is, is essentially, you remember that norm inverse stuff that we were talking about in financial modeling, where you had like the standard normal distribution and it calculates to a probability. So to my understanding, probit, like I think thinks in terms of that standard normal. So this is essentially, these are Z values that are then calculated and essentially interpreted into probabilities. However, it's because it's not uniform, like this 0.85 does not translate into a specific probability because it depends where on that Z scale this is. Like for example, if it's a 0.85, like zero to 0.85 will be a different probability increase than 3 to 3.85. And so sometimes to kind of get a better sense, we have this thing called margins. So what margins does is it takes those results and puts them into a particular uh, format to where this kind of puts it into a percentage uh, context. And there's, a, just to be clear, this specifies at what values of each variable we're working with. So it's if, it's at, if these are all at the means, then this is how much an increase in average grade will increase probability. So an increase of average grade, if all the variables are at their averages and you increase average grade from, what is it, 7.25 to 8.25, that will increase the probability of passing by 10.1%. So that's kind of how probit operates. And, but logit is... More, I would say in my experience, logit's more common. If you ask me why people, whether to use probit or logit, it really depends, I believe, on the distribution. But then we're not, but like it's not something that like you need to be a master at. Uh, but I think the difference between probit and logit in terms of whether it's practical is depending on the underlying distribution of your uh, sample. So for logit, that's also something that you have to be careful with. The way that logit works is its coefficients are e to the odds. They're called, or essentially they're considered log odds. So the log, natural logarithm of the odds or the odds ratio. And so if you take e to the 1.66, for example, you will get the odds ratio in which if you can specify OR in Stata to get the odds ratio. So essentially, once you get the odds ratio, there's actually an example here that illustrates what that means. What an odds ratio means is like, let's say that in, like, in this case, it's flipping a coin. So if you're flipping a coin and there's a 50% probability of heads and a 50% probability of tails, the, the odds ratio is dividing the probability of heads 
divided by the probability of tails, and it's, that's the ratio. So if it's a 50-50 chance, the odds ratio is one. In this case, if the probability of heads is three quarters and the probability of tails is one fourth, then that's three times the amount. And so the odds ratio is three. So essentially any value of the odds ratio above one is, means that it's above 50%. What this is saying is that the probability increase of average grade is five times the amount uh, well, uh, as for an increase in average grade, it will increase the odds ratio by 5.26. Depending on what the odds ratio already is, that would determine what the exact probability increase is. And so usually you can do some kind of algebra to solve. You just f essentially figuring out the odds ratio to solve, find the probability. You'd have to just take e to the standard, this actual coefficient, and then I multiply by what you believe 1 minus p to be, depending on what the average probability is. But that's, again, beyond the scope of the workshop. And then, of course, if you want to look at margins, like, go ahead, go crazy. The last thing is portfolio, portfolio sorting. So I'm not going to go really too much into it. Uh, what this does, so essentially the way it works is uh, you can kind of take a look at it for yourself with, in more detail, but with portfolio sorting, this is essentially how they kind of, they get like the market cap of a portfolio. They want to say, okay, here, this is the biggest, and they want to do like small minus big. And so they might take like, here's like the biggest portfolios, and here are the smallest, and they usually do that sorting by deciles thing. And then that difference becomes like the SMB, for example. Uh, and so then w this is how they kind of go and uh, construct a test for alpha where they run these each portfolio's uh, ca like factor model by SMB, HML, and uh, the market beta based on the SMB and HML that you created. And then they take the uh, intercepts. They want to do is they want to take the intercepts of the regression output and then do a t-test on the intercepts. And so if the intercept is significantly different from zero, we can see that this particular portfolio has a positive alpha. And that's when they say that these, how these factors then increase returns or don't.